when I met you, I was actually married to a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, I was actually in a vineyard church at the time. I didn't have any grid about, I didn't grow up in a Christian home or anything. And I actually sovereignly encountered Jesus. I get the heart behind the seeker sensitive movement, but it's really not helping. Like the chains start rattling when the power of God's flowing, Yeah, you know? And it was in those places where I would feel conviction as opposed to being lulled to sleep and being made to feel comfortable. I don't, I think we're doing a disservice. Welcome to Radical Radio with Robbie Dawkins. Robbie is a renowned speaker and equipper in over 70 countries, as well as author of international best-selling book, Do What Jesus Did. Here's your host, Robbie Dawkins. Hey, welcome to Radical Radio. And I am, let me tell you something. This is gonna be such a great uh, episode. I wanna encourage you right now, do yourself a big favor. First of all, like it, follow the channel, uh, and hit share immediately. Uh, so many of you have been a part of uh, supporting uh, what we're doing here at Radical Radio, and that being an expression and an extension of Robbie Dawkins Ministries. And I really appreciate that. For all those who are partnering with us, uh, the, this program comes to you because people partner in order for us to keep uh, cranking out this type of material. We're very grateful for that and want to encourage you to continue to do that. You can go to my website uh, if you want to partner with us in order to see this keep going forward. We are really going against, you know, the the true adversary here, the enemy here is not people, is not communities, is not groups uh, that disagree with the Bible or anything. Those are all our opportunities to share Christ with. Uh, the, the true enemy is Satan himself and the deception that he's bringing in the world. And Radical Radio is committing to exposing that and exposing the deception of the enemy and perpetuating the truth and the freedom that Jesus Christ brings to all of us. So hit share and share this right now, if you would, and like this. But I am, I, I always say I'm so excited, but I really am. I'm really so excited. <laughs> Nadia, my friend, is here, and she's just a, an amazing person. Uh, we're we're going to be telling you lots of things uh, about her life. She's going to be sharing with us lots of stuff of just incredible things. But it, it I, I'm just especially this month, uh, the month of June, and um, this is being labeled as Pride Month. And uh, we don't really like that term, <laughs> but, but uh, at the same time, you know, we want to make sure and say that we're putting this out for a reason for this month. But Nadia, let me just say this. Nadia is a really phenomenal woman of God. Um, we met, good grief. What, do you remember what year it was? Yeah, I looked it up today because I couldn't Did remember. Did you really? I was it was 2013, 2013. November 2013. I feel like it's been 20 years. <laughs> Not because the relationship has felt like a burden in any way. It's just felt like I just feel like I know you so well. Mm -hmm. And so 2013, so that's 10 years, right? Yeah. And so uh, been friends for 10 years. And man, whenever Nadia would come and join me, she joined me on multiple trips, both international and domestic. I'd always have her get up and share, and I'd always have her get up, uh, share her testimony. It's a powerful one. You're going to hear it today. But also get up and prophesy. She's very gifted in healing, prophetic ministry. And I'm just gonna say this right here now, if you're a pastor or minister, you're probably gonna wanna reach out to Nadia to, to come and speak at your church. Um, she's an equipper of power evangelism. Man, I'm just feeling the Holy Spirit, wow. even as I say that about you. Come like, on. I don't think I've felt that with anybody else I've been introducing, but I just feel the Holy Spirit all over me. She truly is a, uh, a, a, an, a loves equipping people. And of course, you guys know that's my passion and loves training people up in power evangelism, just wants people to encounter Jesus. But Nadia, let me just, first of all, thank you. Thank you for being here. And thank, thank you, you for, for being me. you. You're truly a, a woman of God and somebody that I just have the utmost respect for. But um, would you mind just start off by telling, how did we meet? Where did we meet? How did yeah. we meet? Let's yeah. start there. When I met you, I was actually married to a woman. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually in a vineyard church at the time. I didn't have any grid about, I didn't grow up in a Christian home or anything. And I actually sovereignly encountered Jesus through reading the word of God, actually at MIT of all places. 
It wasn't that someone had witnessed to me. Which per let se. me interrupt. Just it punctuates. The, <laughs> Nadia is probably one. I have several very intelligent friends and she's up at the top of one of my most intelligent friends. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm saying that because of your MIT background. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I, I literally, I, I was completely unchurched, Yeah. you know, and I really did believe the Bible. Like I just believed the word of God. I, my approach was very all or nothing to scripture. Now I hadn't had that revelation from the Lord around the sexuality peace mm -hmm. yet but i totally believed in the gifts of the holy spirit i believe that if it said we could heal the sick that we could heal the sick um if it said we could cast out demons or raise the dead like i just believed it and so and that that was very that was one of the good things about coming to faith in a vineyard church was they really equip you and have a mentality of like everybody gets to play yep and i had actually read your book do what jesus did and was super impacted by it so i was pumped for you to come to mm -hmm. the vineyard. And actually what I love about you is that you just met us right where we were at and you took us out on the streets. You were completely non-religious. You weren't, you didn't like put up a wall, um, yeah. you know, cause my experience in the church at that point, it was either people treated you like you had the plague and wanted nothing to do with you, or you had people that were lying to you and saying, you know, God's blessing this. And, and neither yeah. one of those approaches is good. Like we have to come alongside people right where they yeah. are and walk them through a process. So true. You know, so and good. I didn't feel like that was the first thing that you saw about me. You saw mm -hmm. the call of God on my life. Explain that. So how how yeah. did you how did you know I saw that? Well, actually, I think it was the first night that you ministered there, you ended up prophesying over me about the call of God on my life and I think you had said that I was a trophy in the house of the Lord and and you really mm. the Lord had showed you how I'd been seeking him in the which was true like i was having these amazing encounters with the lord just in my bedroom in my living room and um you really it just it was that that spirit to spirit like it just mm. resonated in such a powerful way like i felt seen and i knew like wow god's really going to use me yeah. and you you spoke that out yeah you know, um, it, it's so cool because I, I remember, I remember, so when they uh, picked me up from the airport, yeah. uh, one of the pastors told me, they said, now there's, there's, there's uh, th this, this couple, I don't know if you heard because your, yours and Mary's marriage was quite a, uh, in the broader vineyard was quite a discussed topic. <gasps> You know, sure. because they were uh, the the senior pastor didn't you do you guys' wedding, but the but one of the assistant or associate pastors did. One of the leaders. Well, he wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a pastor, but one but of the leaders. But he was still a leader. But he was a leader church. in the church. That thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And he um, and so the the one of the pastors told me they said now, uh, you're you know they, they the way they describe you is like she's one of your biggest fans. <laughs> which is what he said. Uh, your book had really impacted her. Da, da, da. Now, he, what's interesting, he didn't tell me your name, didn't say anything about you mm -hmm. in the sense of giving details or anything like that. So when I went to give the prophetic word, the only, the only thing I knew was just that, you know, the book had intrigued you and that you were, you loved what I was doing, but right. I didn't know that you had a heart for ministry or anything like that. And he said, um, and I said, well, let me, let me take them with me out on the streets because the next day we were going out to put in practice what we were training on. And he goes, you would, you would be willing to do that? And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, oh, well, you know, I know your stance on homosexuality. So I was thinking that you would be, I said, no. I said, there's several gay couples in my church. I said, I don't, tell them that it, that it's okay and mm -hmm. I don't give them permission. I said I speak the truth in love, but I they're friends and I I've had many meals with them, had m much relate. They're a part of my church. I'm their pastor. Right. You know, so it was an interesting perspective for him and he was like pretty surprised, but I was like, "No, let me take them out. I'd love to do that." And so, which we did. But it was interesting cuz it was that Friday night. Now I'm beginning to recall where yeah. I did have that word for you and had I think just met you, or maybe I didn't meet you, and then I gave you, had that word for you. But you looked quite different then. Yeah, I did. 
Can you I talk did. a little bit about that? Sure. I had, um, so my dad actually had, he abandoned me when I was really young. Mm. And I think that brought a lot of just confusion and insecurity in my identity as a woman. Mm -hmm. And so back when you met me, I was dressing like a boy. Mm -hmm. And one of the lies, it sounds really silly to say it now, but I was believing that I could be and act as Mary's husband, yeah. you know, in this marriage. And that was a way of kind of justifying. Yeah. And what, 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 how did you, how, how did, how did that work for you? Like, how did you, how did you come to that conclusion or what were things that were going on maybe in your life that led to this is the direction I'm going to go, or this is how I'm going to be. Yeah. So I struggled a lot with just even, even before I met Mary, just with a lot of confusion around sexuality and, and promiscuity. And I was really like, with the boyfriends that I had, I, it was really hard for me to trust a man and mm -hmm. to open up. And so Mary, it felt comfortable. It felt safe. Um, and so I think that that was part of it. And I, now I'd always had, you know, I think I first started having same sex attraction when I was probably like 11 or 12, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think it was more women felt safer to me. And it was, a yeah. Hey, we're taking a break right now. And I want to encourage you to come and join us August 2nd through the 5th. We are doing an act school right here in the United States. Our act schools is usually Arab kingdom training schools, but this one, August 2nd through the 5th is going to be the American kingdom training schools. My dear friend, Andrew Cannon coming from the UK is going to join us. And he and I both have been a part of equipping underground churches in dangerous countries throughout the world. Well, we're going to be training you in the power gifts of healing, prophetic deliverance, ministry of manifest presence, sending you out to the streets to bring people that life forming transformation and encounter with Jesus Christ. You don't want to miss it, go to Acts, A-K-T-S dot global now, sign up and we'll see you there. Now back to Radical Radio. So is that is that something that, you know, because we're seeing a lot of communication right now that if you have any questions or any doubts, immediately you've got to stop and probe whether or not you're having that same sex attraction, whether it is that same sex attraction. Now I can say easily, Nadia, that at 11 or 12 years old, I, I had thoughts that would be confusing to me. Sure. I was, I was coming into puberty. I would be like, you know, I liked hanging out with my guy friends. I liked, and I could easily stop and go, well, wait a minute, because I didn't understand, you know, mm -hmm. up until that point, girls were icky. <laughs> they had cuties. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I'm talking about the old language. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm dating myself by saying that right now. But so I could I could have easily, you know, stopped and said that there was that too. Do you feel like there's a a part of that was going on? Or 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 do you feel like it was like a pure attraction standpoint? Or was well, it just the confusion? Because I'm hearing you keep saying I was very confused. I think it could have been, but also I think it was probably a decade before they really started aggressively pushing this on kids. And they're, they're literally so they're, you know, children are so malleable mm -hmm. and they're putting ideas in children's heads that weren't even there before. Right. And if you express even the smallest amount of confusion, they're going to stick, Oh, you're non-binary you're this or that. Um, so I think it's far worse, but I do think just, in the secular world, there was just confusion and immorality in the entertainment industry, all, you know, in the music industry, all of that was going on the undercurrents of that for sure. And did that perpetuate where your confusion was or where you're like, where do I land? Where am I? Yeah. And then I where think are my attractions where that, I think I just had like just a lot of pain inside mm. and there was a, like a rebellion yeah. At the core. And so that was a way of rebel, you know, even in high school, I wanted to get back at my teachers. I wanted to get back at my mom, not to say that they were horrible people or anything, but I just had this rebellion yeah. of I'm going to rebel against society. I'm going to go into the gay lifestyle. Like when I was 16, I went into the gay lifestyle. It was just for a year, but I had almost dropped out of high school. I started experimenting with drugs, getting into new age stuff. It was a very dark period. 
of my life. And then my senior year, I went back in the closet, had a boyfriend, wasn't very nice to him, unfortunately, you know, and then I didn't get in the relationship with Mary until college. Now, you had said to me at one point that there was uh, in some of your other relationships, there was there was a different points hostility, like there was different points you were struggling with emotions. Was that hostility that was coming in in both sides from both people, or was that something happening within you yourself? What do you mean by hostility? Like, I don't know. I just remember at one point we had a conversation where you were like, there was a lot of, or, or maybe you didn't say hostility. There was a lot of um, anger. Anger. I'm sorry. Anger forgive, for me sure. I, forgive me if I, forgive me if I use hostility. So, no, so anger. You probably can't imagine this, but I had a really, really bad temper, like explosive temper. I cannot imagine that knowing you yeah. the way I do now. And that was one of the first things that the Lord delivered me of actually. Can I say this real quick? Yeah. I want to hear that. Anybody who knows Nadia there and even just here us, when Nadia kind of comes into a room, there's this, this sense of peace. Like you really carry the Prince of Peace. There's no question. And that you just, you, you, there's just like a bubble of grace and peace that's wow. about you. And so this is a, this is the power of your testimony because you were this very angry person, and now the transformation of Christ in you, there's this, this ministry of peace that just, I don't even think you're intending it. It just sort of pulsates from you. Wow. But anyway, but let's talk about that anger because that's, yeah. this is a powerful part of your testimony, I feel. Yeah, yeah. So, that, I mean, it was, that, it was anger, and then I had really bad anxiety and panic attacks, and those were like the two first things that the Lord had delivered me from. What and were you angry about? I just, I, I think a lot of it was generational. Okay. And then, cause on, on both, um, uh, uh, you know, on both family sides, there mm -hmm. was a history mm -hmm. of volatility. And then I think I was just frustrated, you know, and I, I didn't know how to express my emotions. And so it came out in anger. Like if it was a situation that I felt out of control. Mm. With and so Mary and I would, would get in these explosive arguments, um, and then that was interesting because as soon as I met the Lord, we just stopped fighting. Wow. Yeah. So immediately there was uh, when you came into a relationship with Christ, there was this peace. But right. you did say, if I can ask you a little bit more, because you did say you were in, you were in some heterosexual relationships before that, yeah. which by the way, let me just say for myself, I'm not saying this for you. You can agree or disagree. That's fine. Mm. I, first of all, the, the term homosexuality to me is a totally misleading term because there totally. is no homosexuality. God created one sexuality and that was between man and woman. That's right. And I, my perspective, and I would love to get your input on this. We could, I, I want to get back to your testimony. I don't want to bypass that. But my perspective of that is like, there's a lot of people, like I have a cousin who's a very effeminate guy. It's just who he is. We used to always jokingly say his, he should have been named Jacob because Jacob in the Bible, not because of all the Jacobs out there, but because Jacob in the Bible was kind of with his mom in the kitchen cooking, you know, he was that guy. And Esau was more of the, uh, you know, let me go hunt. Let me go, you know, gather food, you know, kind of that guy. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, clearly Jacob had more children than Esau. So he was clearly a balanced guy in his sexuality, right. but that there, the enemy comes in with a lot of deception because if, so for instance, if a, if a female's maybe a little bit stronger we immediately want to peg them as, oh, she must be lesbian because she's a stronger female or she's this or this, you know, which that's not always, that's not true of both of the females in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yet we sort of peg that. And with the males, if they're a little bit more effeminate, we sort of peg them as being that, oh, well, they must be gay. When uh, what I found, like my cousin married a, a woman who's more stronger, more assertive, more... And they're, they're in this perfect relationship. They had a lot of kids. They have a lot of, like, they have a great relationship, mm -hmm. you know, but it's just the balance of what God had intended for those individuals. Right. You know what I mean? And so we sort of, our society, I think because of sin in our community, our society, meaning community of just humanity, we open the door 
for all of this other thinking and stuff and labeling, which puts people in a in a in a path that God didn't intend. That's right. That's right. And you're actually cursing them. You're pronouncing a word curse this when is you important. speak a false identity over someone. So I think both as individuals, we have to be really careful with what are we labeling ourselves as. So good. Like if you struggle with depression, you don't say my identity is a depressed person. No, you might struggle with depression, but that's not who you are. And so language matters. Yes. Um, so I don't recommend that you'd say, oh, I'm gay. No, you can say, I'm struggling with same-sex attraction. Yeah. Um, but we don't want to put false identities on ourselves because you're, you're, you're giving an invitation to the enemy. Like, come and latch on to me. I give you permission. Yeah, that's so true. As parents, we got to watch that. As as people that are leaders, teachers, whatever, to, right. to stop and mislabel and add something to people's identity that we think is being helpful, but it's actually being very harmful. That's right. And so did that ever happen to you? Were there any teachers, any coaches, anything where that sort of sort of pushed a little bit more into that direction? Mm, I don't think so. Not in my case. Yeah. I'm yeah. just asking because I don't think we've ever had but that But it was more— I think if you were, because I wasn't like super, I mean, I was a tomboy. I guess I was tomboyish growing up, but like the girls that were super athletic that you might get more, oh, she's a lesbian, she's this or that, like that were very like more masculine look, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like stockier, athletic, those kind of girls. Um, I'm pretty delicate framed. So no. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's really, I'm glad you said that because let me say something about that. Yeah. When we first met, like everything you're saying, I didn't see that about you at all. I, I saw that you were, the way you were wearing your hair was more like a boy. The mm. way you were dressing was more like a boy. But when I talked to you, I very, I saw you as very feminine. I saw you as very, I, I saw... Who, how I see you now and what I know of you now is what I really saw then. I mm -hmm. saw, And I don't know if it was a prophetic thing, if I was just I seeing it, through the eyes yeah. of the Lord, but I didn't see this. I didn't, in my opinion, you, it was, if it wasn't for the way you were dressed and the way you cut your hair, I didn't see you as, you know, trying to come off masculine or anything like that. I honestly, and I'm being truthful about that because mm -hmm. if I did, I'd tell you, but I didn't see that about you. I saw, I saw you, I, I just, I, I saw it. And I think I was irritated at, at the church that people were adding to confusion. Right. That's the thing that really upset me. Well, in that whole thing, I didn't blame you or blame Mary. I was blaming the leadership of why aren't you making it clear? Yeah. And why aren't you helping these guys? Because they're clearly here. And and then we went out on the streets together. Mm -hmm. And we were doing ministry together. That was, uh, we went to lunch first. Because mm -hmm. I, I like to eat. remember that. But we went to, I think we went to some burger Tasty place. Tasty burger. Tasty burger, that's yeah. right. And it was, uh, and it was, it was just so delightful just meeting the two of you and and being, you know, together. But the the uh, so we had we had one of the associate pastors with us, and then another guy who thank God we had him because he spoke Spanish. Yeah. So we were I was training him too. The, right. It was really the three of you guys that were coming along, plus the associate pastor. He wanted to learn as well, you mm -hmm. know, more about power evangelism. But what I came what I came to an understanding with when I came back to the church, I pulled the pastor aside and I was really upset at him. And I told him, I said, you, you've misled these guys mm. and you're misleading them. And I'm really upset. And I remember saying the statement, I said, because, and I picked this up and this is not to diss Mary. I consider her a friend too. So I don't want to say it like, like she's not, but I, I, I could pick up how deeply you really loved Jesus. Yeah, for like, sure. Like I could feel it and I could see it. And we, even at <laughs> one point, as this, this, and of course, everybody who knows me, talk about radical. <laughs> this is Miss Radical right here. Uh. You, there was a guy with a bullhorn out in in the uh, in the in the community Square, area. Yeah. yeah, and you walked up. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I just asked him for the bullhorn, and he gave it. He to was me. protesting. 
he was protesting and I just gave a call like, hey, we're just out here praying for the sick. If there, if you have any pain in your body, we want to pray for you. Yeah. And she's like, Jesus will heal you. Come over here. <laughs> it was great. I loved it. I was like, oh, I have found a kindred spirit in Nadia <laughs> for sure. You know, my evangelism style was a little bit more off the wall then. I loved it. I loved it because it was so it was so good. So after after we met and we went through that, and by the way, what did that time do for you with going out on the streets and stuff like that? How because you had already been you already really had been applying some of this already. I want to make that clear. Yeah. So it, I mean, first off, it meant a lot to me that like you saw who I was in Christ and you were able to see my destiny in Him and not just focused on the fact that I was in a same-sex marriage. But I would say that time was a catalyst, you know? And I 100% believe in impartation, so I believe you coming there, and that I consider you to be like a spiritual father to me. So it really kind of propelled me of continuing to make that a lifestyle. And then it ultimately helped me to get free Mm -hmm. because I was able to see this is actually starting to hinder my walk with Jesus. And I was starting to feel like a hypocrite and like, I'm an ambassador for Christ and yet I'm married to a woman. What kind of witness am Mm. I giving? You know? Yeah. You know, and I could start to feel "Mm, this isn't what God, you know, you start to feel that conviction. And it's interesting that that happened because one of the things I said to your pastor is I said to him, I said, I said, man, she loves Jesus. And she's going to get into the word. I didn't know at that time you were already into the word, but I was like, she's going to get into the word of God and she's going to discover what you're saying is misleading and is not truthful and is not. Now, I wouldn't say that he was exactly on the page I was on, obviously, at that time, but Mm -hmm. in the attempt, and I think that church was trying to be the big word right now is inclusive, you know, and trying to be, you know, we were using terminology in the vineyard at that time as welcoming. And I'm all about welcoming because I want to be that. But at the same time, when inclusivity includes condoning and permissiveness of things that are clear in the word of God, well, that's when I draw the line. Yeah. And that line was being crossed from my perspective in that situation, that it was not, it was no longer. Now, let's just say about that church, they're no longer a part of the vineyard. They Mm -hmm. actually ended up withdrawing over this issue um, and are no longer a part of the vineyard. But um, you, and I'm saying that on behalf of the vineyard and on the behalf of that church, but you... You kept, and I told him, I said, she's going to read the word of God and she's going to see and she's going to look at you as being deceiving her. And was that how it kind of played out or how would you see it? Yeah, that's that's exactly. And how did you come to that point? What happened? What happened? What was that journey? Um, How I came to that point was really through intimacy with the Lord. Um, Mm. Just there's like, I would spend all my free time in his presence and in the word of God. And I'd have these powerful encounters with him. And when you encounter the love of the father, he reveals our identity. And so where I had rejected my femininity, he revealed that identity as Mm -hmm. no, you're, you're my beloved daughter, you know? And it was kind of like, okay, I don't have to reject who God's made me to be. And it, and it no longer made sense for me to be married to a woman. And I was able to see like, Hey, this is actually hindering Mm. my walk with the Lord. And, you know, one of the things, so I I get the heart behind the seeker sensitive movement, but it's really not helping. Like we don't cage a lion. We want to, to just let him loose, let God be God. Right. And it's in, it was in meetings where the power of God was flowing that you begin to feel like the chains start rattling when the power of God's flowing, Yeah, you know? And it was in those places where I would feel conviction as opposed to being lulled to sleep and being made to feel comfortable. I don't, I think we're doing a disservice to people when we try to quench the power of God because we're afraid, oh, they might think this is weird, you know? Well, it's, it's that whole thing of, of, you know, God won't behave. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. That's, that's my, that's me putting my words in it. And that he's not going to be, you know, I, I remember going to minister at a church one time. It wasn't that church, but they, they, you know, and, and it, in, in the church you were attending at the time and in, in favor of them, they just, the, the one thing they said is, you know, whatever you, they, first of all, they did tell me, they said, in coming and speaking here, you cannot talk about any, you can't talk about the gay community. You can't reference that. I wasn't even allowed to say uh, that that was sin or just quote anything from the scripture about mm-hmm. that. They, they, they clearly spelled that out. You'd say, you cannot talk about this. You cannot address this. You can't even wow. uh, say this. That's what they told me before going. And then, um, and which I was typically, I had, now, let me clarify, had I been told that in advance enough, I probably wouldn't have come. <gasps> now, I see you as the fruit of them not telling me that right. because it was important that we meet. That's for sure. It was important. It was significant that we meet and that we, that we have this friendship and have this you know, I, I see you, you, you say that as a spiritual father. I mean, I definitely, you're family to me, mm. you know. Uh, and so I, for me, it was, I was very concerned with their approach on it. But at the same time going, well, let me let me go and, and, and at least exemplify maybe somehow. And I was hoping that there would be a powerful Holy Spirit moment that would maybe be revealing to anybody that was caught up in this deception to see the light Mm. of that. But so you had coming back into your story, you had these encounters Mm -hmm. with Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit. What did those look like? Mm, It looked like I would be just the weighty presence of God, just like all over me. And just, I would just weep in his presence and just stuff like he would just deliver me of stuff and just delivering me of the shame of my past. Um, you know, God, I remember one time he was so close, like I could literally feel his breath Whoa. on me, <laughs> you know? And I just thought that that's normal Christianity, which it should be. Let's make that normal Christianity to Come have on. that kind of intimacy Let's bring that. Yeah. with him. Mm. Um, but the Lord was so intentional in revealing himself to me and revealing his love for me. Like I could just feel the presence of God just resting on me. And what did, how did you, how did your body respond? It felt amazing. I felt peace. I felt yeah. love. Were you rocking you know, I and felt rolling? Joy. Were you-, <laughs> you know, and I had a, I went, um, yeah, I actually, this was in 2015 and it was actually a few months before, before Mary and I separated. Yeah. And it was at a VOA conference and I just got hit with the power of God, just electricity flowing through me, shaking and baking on the ground for 20 (laughs) to 30 minutes. And I had so much shame on me from that relationship and the Lord delivered Mm. me of that and he filled me with joy and the joy never left. And that's the thing, the more free you get, the more joy you have. That's so good. And now the, the shame, you know, there's a lot of people out there when anybody who is in that community, in the gay community, they will say, you know, well, the shame that we feel or the shame that they feel is because of people like you who are saying this isn't right and this isn't of God. And so they sort of, but shame that was being broken off of you, where do you see that shame coming from? Well, I think whenever we do anything that's out of step with the will of God, and, and particularly often with, with sexual sin, mm-hmm. it, sexual sin especially produces mm-hmm. a lot of shame and that tendency, and we saw it even in the garden after the fall, that tendency to cover and to hide Yeah, right. from God, you know? And that's, he wants the opposite. He wants us to run to him and he wants to set us free. Yeah, and the, you know it's so interesting because I, I I've said it on here before. Shame isn't something that comes from God. No, it doesn't. Shame is from Satan. That's right. And so when people are feeling shame, but yet the realization of I've done wrong as a result of my sin, that's conviction. Conviction, and that's letting the Lord put His finger on something. Yeah, and it's because right? He's trying to pull us to Him. That's right. 
And so how, you were feeling that in that moment. So the Lord was actually trying to set you free from the shame. Yes, he was. That Satan had put. Now, th- isn't this incredible, Nadia? Satan tempts us with this sin, any sin. And let's just be clear. There, there's, there, the sin is sin. Sex outside of marriage is sin. Sex outside of marriage is sin. Yes. Regardless of what type of sex it is, it's sin. So here Satan entices you, deceives you, makes you think 11 years old, my sexuality, I'm in this place of confusion. I'm in this place of attraction to the opposite, which again, most people going through puberty have that. Mm. We're going, we're in that place of confusion. We're in that. And so this is the reason why, where we're at right now. I mean, this, what's happening in our society right now has got to really tick you off. Yeah, it really does. Because you could be, why? Well, because we're in, I mean. It's, you were in that vulnerable position. I was in that vulnerable position and it's being pushed to a whole new level and people are doing irreversible damage to their bodies and they're targeting children who are the most vulnerable of society with this lie and they want to put kids on hormone blockers and puberty blockers. It's crazy. And what, um, what, what we were talking before, if, if you're comfortable talking about this, we were talking before, if you would have kept going down this path. Yeah. Or if it had happened, like imagine that you met me, say it was 10 years later, I could have easily said, Oh, I'm trans. You know, in fact, when I was at MIT, I even went to a trans meeting and I considered it. Mm -hmm. Praise God, I never went through with it. Yeah. Because it does so much damage to the body. It does so much damage. And I, but you know what? I believe God's going to radically deliver people and we're going to see creative miracles. Preach that. Like, come on. Preach that. Yeah. What what do you envision? What kind of creative miracles? People are going to get breasts. Come on. They're going to get their sexual organs restored. They're going to be where they were infertile. They're going to become fertile. Short that up. You know, actually, one of the first miracles I saw was a man that got a new face. Who? Can I share that or no? Please go for it. Of course. Okay. So, you know, Ken Fish. So, my first mission trip was actually with Ken. And we prayed for, there was a man there who his face had been, it was all bandaged up. His face had been completely eaten away by cancer. And I prayed, my friend and I prayed for him. Now, I'm not expecting anything to happen. You know, I'm like, this. how is this guy even alive? But we just prayed in faith with the little faith that we had. Yeah. You know, and he kept saying, oh, I'm feeling heat in my face, that he was saying that. Now that Monday, so I think we prayed for him on a Saturday. The Monday, he was supposed to have a skin grafting procedure. He goes to the doctor. His face had completely grown back. The whole procedure gets canceled. Come on. And that's, God can do that. It's easy for God. Yes, I love that. You know, so we need, in this time, we need creative miracles. Yes. And we need the deliverance ministry. Yeah. So when you when you were at that place where the spirit of God and you're feeling and that weighty presence of God, you know, we know in the original language the kabod. Yeah. The weighty kabod. The the tingly euphoric light feeling is amazing. But the kabod is this you know, just sort yeah. of this weight of God on you. And and in that time, you started feeling this joy. You were yeah. being released from the shame that again comes from Satan. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's, this is why so many people in the LGBTQ plus whatever the others are there, all of that, this shame is not really coming from the outside. It truly is coming from Satan himself. Totally. And so we are the agents as ambassadors of Christ to bring in, as you now, as I said, no joke, like you're an, to me, I see you as an ambassador of peace, Mm. but you're also radical. (laughs) Anybody knows, you know, you're right. I mean, you're in Northern Mozambique as a missionary, you know, in In this hostile, (laughs) you know, this, Radical Islamic opposition, and yet you're there in this war zone, bringing the peace, the love, the grace, the transformation of God. But but back to what I was saying, people are are in this play, and so many people in the LGBTQ plus community are committing suicide yeah. because of that shame. Now, those of us who are more from the 
conservative side of things, if you look at it from a political perspective, I would prefer to look at it, my perspective, more than a political stance is a biblical stance. Right. And so Absolutely. being in that biblical stance, they want to blame us for the shame that they're feeling. But that's not what God ministers. That's what, Now, if somebody is in a Christian community feeling shame, Satan can use Christians to shame people. Oh, absolutely. And can try to bring that condemnation. And I, I think the church overall hasn't done a great job with this issue. Um, Speak to that. You know, we've put, you know, in the love the sinner, hate the, the sin, we've actually ended up hating people. Yeah. You know, and they felt judged and condemned. You know, we haven't done a good job of meeting people where they're at. And we've actually pushed people that God sent to the church. We've actually sent them away. Mm-hmm. Right. But then you've got on the other hand where you're saying God's blessing this. You know, we have people who are lying to us in the church. We have people who treated us like we had the plague or we had people that were lying yeah. to us, you know? And, and one of the things this, it, 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 it's a stumbling block for both the affirming and also for the religious was the fact that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and I was seeing sick people get healed. Right. I was having prophetic I watched you do it while you in a process, right? Yes. And so the church, the church that we were part of, they put us up as the poster children for this controversy that they were going through. Then they were saying, oh, because God's using them and because Nadia's hungry for Jesus, this just goes to show that you can be in this lifestyle and be a follower of Jesus. But the thing is that new creation, when we get born again, it's a process, right? That new creation life starts to form right. on the inside of us. And so with something like this, where it's a deception and God actually sovereignly has to remove that veil, it's not, you know, it's not a, it doesn't mean that God's blessing it. It just means he's used, you know, he'll use, he's used a donkey in scripture. He can talk through a donkey. Like he can use anything. You've seen atheists pray for people. And they get healed. So it's dangerous to say that because God's using this person, that means that everything in their life is right before God. We've seen many anointed men and women of God that are living in immorality, and but God's still using them. The, and I, that's exactly a point I was about to make. I, I mean, I literally have a, a friend. He's still a friend. I love him. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with him. He's in an extramarital relationship. He's Mm -hmm. having sex outside of marriage with somebody. And yet he's using the justification. Well, you just saw these people get healed. You just saw these people that I led to Christ. So obviously God must be okay with me and where we're at and where, and it is a lie. Yeah. That's so dangerous. It's such a lie. And you know, this is where I think we have to be clear as the church is because at that point, using signs and wonders, as justification for me to stay in my brokenness, for me to stay in my sin, is totally then you, is is being in a place of as a minister is stopping and saying the word of God then doesn't have any need to speak into this or doesn't have you know it's like it's negating that, and yet I'm going to lead people to Christ while being in this place of sin. So we're not saying that at all because right. that was it was very much an important part of your story of somebody thinking they were being loving. And I believe that with your church, they sure. thought they were being loving. They did. Yeah. They told me, I don't think you're being loving. And yet <laughs> here you and I are connected. Yeah, <laughs> and that's right. Have this really, because, and yet I never came out to you and was like, Nadia, you're in sin. Nadia, you shouldn't be married no, to you Mary. Never did. I never did that. What I did is I prayed like crazy. Wow. And I Thank interceded like crazy. Like from the moment I met you guys, I was like, Father, reveal yourself. Father, reveal the truth. Reveal what your plan for sexuality is to them. Reveal your love for them. Reveal your embrace, your acceptance, mm-hmm. and reveal the truth. Yeah. And so that was my prayer. Now, there was probably a lot of things that you read because I I dealt with these subjects in my book. I remember, and you know what, Nadia, it's interesting because I remember when my second book came out, Identity Thief, Mm -hmm. and I speak to homosexuality. And I say, so the thought you had or the feeling you had at an 11-year-old, I'm saying those are fiery darts of Satan. 
It's right. not your actual natural attraction. It's a fiery dart of the enemy to hijack your identity and to confuse and derail that. And I remember I was, I honestly, before the Lord, I was a little nervous because I didn't want you and Mary to feel, and, and there were, there were, there were, because the gay couples that were in my church, first of all, they heard me preach about it. So they knew my stance. Mm -hmm. They weren't even in question because they knew where I stood and they knew I loved them. I was like, I'm a, you're going to hear the truth from me no matter what. Right. And I'm going to love you no matter what, but I'm going to speak the truth to you because if I don't, I don't love you. Right. And you're going to know I love you. But with you guys, I was a little bit nervous, honestly. I mean, this book is going out to tens of thousands of people, you know? <laughs> but I was worried about you guys because I loved you, because I cared about you, and I didn't want you to feel condemned or anything like that. Yeah. And I love the fact that it that that it never felt like that to you. Yeah. Because I did want to walk with you. I did, and you would text me. We would communicate. Right. You know, uh, periodically, and you know, a lot of it was coaching on. Hey, I hit some. I prayed for somebody that didn't get healed. What happened here? <laughs> it was more of that type of stuff. But but how is that what you would encourage people? Is that approach and 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 coach me in it because so, I want to. Yeah, know. and and I don't have all the answers. In this, I do think we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. But I think absolutely, like from the pulpit, we have to preach the full counsel of God's Word. Come on. We have to preach truth and have people's minds renewed in the truth of God. So that includes preaching about marriage sex, and sexuality, not shying away from particular topics because they're divisive. We have to preach that life begins at conception. Mm. You know, we shouldn't be afraid because— Okay, people are going to get on. mad. They might leave the church. No, we keep doing that. And in fact, in my, you know, I actually listened to Dr. Michael Brown when he preached so good. at IHOP. And I was like, you know what? He's making good points. I don't disagree with him. At the same time, I think we have to be sens sensitive if you're in a pastoral position or if you're discipling someone. Do I have authority and permission to speak in to this area in yeah. someone's life? Like, you know, say I noticed that Robbie lies a lot. Well, am I supposed to just intercede for him or is God telling me to speak into Robbie's life and to put my finger on yeah. this thing right now? And timing matters. You know, when, yeah. we, when, when Mary and I were engaged, there was a man who I didn't know at all, never been to our church before, and he calls us out on this thing. You know, it's like, have you read the Bible? You know, and it was super not, I just felt exposed it was the timing wasn't right. It wasn't helpful, you know? But then it was a couple years down the road that I was ready for God to start yeah. speaking in this. And it was very, I think with something like that, like I had been with Mary for 10 years. So it was scary and there was so much that was invested there. Yeah, And there definitely was, like I loved Mary. That That's mm -hmm. real, even yeah. though that's not what God had for me, but there's real cost. And so that was another factor, you know, in the in the Western church, especially in America, that we're not used to having to pay a price for our faith. Now I believe that's gonna shift. God's literally shaking everything. Yeah. Right now. Come on. Um, but yeah, so you know, so I would look around at other people and not seeing that why do I have to pay this price, but other people aren't having to pay this price. Yeah. And 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 when you so so you have this so so you come to a point where all of a sudden you're like, okay, this has got to, a change has to come. Yeah. In this relationship. Yeah. How did that, you you you, you alluded to it, but then how did yeah. that, how did that and it, walk? It, it actually, the, the pinnacle of it happened two years after meeting you, like the mm. same month, the same two years of the date. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was looking up the dates before I got on here just to do my homework. You know, because God often does things. Yeah. Like that. No. Um, so it was definitely important that I meet you. But what had happened was we had actually applied to a, a mission school. Um, and I had actually asked you to write a letter of recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, and you know, and when I was with Mary, one of the things I said, I said to the Lord, I even made a vow to the Lord. I said, if, if Mary's not in the picture, I'll be a missionary for you in northern Mozambique. Like I said, in Mozambique. Wow. I didn't say Northern Mozambique. I said in Mozambique, I'd actually said that to him. 
Wow. Uh, you know, we have to be careful what we vow to the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> what what does this scripture say? Keep that which I have committed to him. He'll keep what I've committed to him. <laughs> yeah. So so we we applied. We obviously didn't get into the school. I don't think they even knew how to handle it. They like waited till two weeks before the school started to tell us, like, hey, sorry, the school's full. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, the Lord really actually used that. And yeah. I went through actually a really dark season after mm-hmm. that because the enemy came in. He said, not only are you going to lose Mary, but you're going to, Jesus is going to abandon you too. Mm. And you're going to spend eternity with me. That's complete lie. Yeah. Wow. Complete what lie. Deception. And yeah, I was yeah. having demons. They were choking me in the night. Mm-hmm. Severe demonic. The enemy was terrified for me to get out of this relationship. Yes. You know, so he's pulling out all the stops. This is so important because that I've heard that from several people who've broken free, who've come out of the bondage of that deception and said that for that very thing. It's like the enemy doesn't want you to leave that. No, he doesn't. He wants you bound. He wants yeah. you, you know, the more free you are, the more impact you can have for God's kingdom. Yes. Um. So... Mary, actually, she was kind of frustrated with the whole situation. She said, Nadia, why don't we just take three weeks apart and just pray and really seek the Lord? Mm -hmm. And so I rented an an Airbnb and just, um, you know, one of the nights I just had a picture of myself. I saw like these like thorns that were wrapped around my legs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Lord, you know, what is this? And I felt like he said, "Um, it's shame and embarrassment regarding your relationship with Mary. And then I saw like a fork in the road and I knew I could lay this down and be all in for Jesus or I could fully embrace mm. this this lifestyle. And I was just kind of overwhelmed, I said, oh, you know, just after that encounter. And then um, a week later, I end up having a dream. This is still during that three week time. And um, in that dream, Mary and I are like swimming, ba- like we're voluntarily swimming back and forth in this like neon green water. And even our cat was there. She didn't even want to be in this water. And then this lady from the church that we we're part of shows up and we said to her in the dream, this is hindering us. And she said, well, then you have your answer. Wow. Yeah. And I knew, I, I knew what I needed to do. And, I'm, I, and not that God had to speak through those dreams and visions, but it's the kindness Yes. of the Lord to give those extra confirmations. And, and there was so much grace just mm. to walk it out. And even Mary, like she was initially devastated sure, when we had to separate, but then she ends up having this God encounter in an Uber and it just completely lifts off of her. Wow, man, that is so powerful. I love that. You know, it's it's it is God. You know, and, and we say in the scripture, you know, it, His compassion leads to repentance. It's mm-hmm. not His harshness. It's not His firm rebuke, but His compassion draws us right. to that place. And repentance means just to turn around, to turn That's around right. from the sin, to turn around from the brokenness. That's right. And move to the healing. Move to the the wholeness that Christ it, offers. Right. And it's not that God's mean and just giving us this list of rules. It's He knows what will make us thrive. And he wants us to be as whole and free as possible. So good. That is so good. I love that. And, and, and you know, there's a lot of people, um, you know, that, that are, are, are walking through that, that are in this. I pray that many of them that are watching right now that are walking in that place. And, and if you don't mind, and one of the things I never want to do with anybody, especially like anybody who's had like substance addiction or something like that, I never want them to revisit this from the place to where they're entertaining. But in that coming through, in that breakthrough, but I don't want to mislead people from the standpoint that, okay, have these radical God encounters, therefore everything goes. I'm totally... I'm a, I'm a complete success story now. I've totally broken free. Mm. There have there been times that the enemies tried to throw temptation back in to enter back in or or to mess with your head, you know, or heart with any of that. Yeah. So there there was one time in particular where I was really mad and offended at God about some things and about and really the enemy tried to bring me back into that lifestyle of like 
I was kind of just questioning everything. Like maybe I just completely missed it. Maybe I've laid down my career at Google, all this stuff for nothing. And th that was a dark season of my life and where I considered it. But praise God, I like the Lord brought me back. Yeah. But I was just really mad at God. I was just, you know what I mean? My yeah. heart wasn't in a good place. Yeah. But really the fear of the Lord came in after that. It's like, I have to stay as close to Jesus as possible. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's almost it's like if we go back, we end up even worse, right? Than yeah when we started, and that was like a wake up call. Like, wow, I really need to guard my heart and stay close to him. I can't play games because all those demonic attacks that were trying to keep you locked up in that prison of deception and keep you locked up in that, all of a sudden. The enemy's throwing that door open, trying to pull you back into it, you know, because mm -hmm. he wants you back under that control. Totally. And I mean, this is something I say to people all the time. Don't trust your feelings. They'll lie to you. Totally. Don't trust your thoughts. They'll lie to you. And we have this feeling, and, I, and I've said this to many people, like if, I've done a lot of ministry in Boys Town in Chicago, mm -hmm. which is a massive gay community in Chicago. And one of the things I would often say to, to guys, I would primarily minister to the guys there. Okay. And the and the the males in that community seem to be kind of the more uh out there with it, more expressive. I mean, they're they're lust well, may I I th I mean males and females have different f expressions of when lust is hitting them and totally. how they they but they were more flamboyant in it in the sense and I don't mean expression in the sense of you know, displaying more feminine sides or whatever, but they would be more expressive than mm -hmm. I would see in the lesbian side of things. The females were more, not so much, you know, but but I would see that. And so I would try to go, you know me, I'd try to go for, <laughs> for whoever was in the <laughs> most expressive, you right, know. Right, right. And, and, I, and I really was, I was impacted how so many be like, you know, but you don't understand since I was nine, I had these thoughts, I had these feelings. Now I would do something a lot of people don't do. And even, I could even probably get shots for saying it here, but I've already said it here already. I would say, no, but you don't think I had any of those thoughts when I was that age too? Sure. You don't think I had questions? I would look at playmates and go, you know, in my, in my biological the time it was saying, you know, there was an, there should be an attraction here. There was, and I would be, I would confuse those never acted on it. Thank God. But at the same time, it was, uh, well, what, what am I attracted to him? Who am I attracted to? You know, very shortly it was, it cleared up for me, but I could have really gone off track with that. And of course, telling young children today, no, follow that feeling that's why it's so yeah, completely dangerous. That's so dangerous. And we're putting them in harm's way by the enemy himself because you're then handing them over to the devil. Right. By doing that and making the, the making their mind, their emotion and their body Satan's playground, right. really. And that's the danger of all this. But don't trust your thoughts and feelings. No. Don't and of course in that moment, I and listen, Nadia, I was in that play. I've been mad at God. I've been upset at the Lord. And then like, hey, how could you do this? How could this happen? I've had heartache and mm -hmm. personal deep pain relationally and been through hard, yeah. hard places and have been like, hey, how could this have happened? I was trying to follow you. I thought I was doing the right thing. But then would always come to the place of your Lord. I'm not. You, you right. see everything. You know everything. That's I don't. Right. I always come to the point, God, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> so. I'm going to yield to you because you're the smartest being that's ever lived. And I'm certainly not. <laughs> that's right. But what are, you, what are some of the what, people that are going through those thoughts and feelings? Maybe maybe speak to them a little bit of anybody who, when I say going through those thoughts and feelings, people who are in the place of confusion, like what would you yeah. say to them in conversation or in? Yeah. I mean, I think we all have, unless you're perfect, right? Which none of us are. None of us. We all from time to time have ungodly thoughts. Yep. Right. And the scripture actually tells us that we have to take our thoughts captive. Hear it. You know, and of mm -hmm. course, God can speak through your thoughts. He can speak through your feelings. But the litmus test, we have to line it up. Does this agree with scripture? And does That's this it. produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, we have to discard that. You know, we don't just take that on as our identity. Just because you have depressive thoughts, is that your identity? And should you keep meditating 
on on those lies? No, absolutely not. Um, but I, I think it's like, you know, don't panic just because, say, you have a thought of a same-sex attraction, but don't take action. You know, don't lean into it. Just brush so it off. You know, and the rest of that scripture says, take those thoughts captive and make them yield to the will of That's God. That's right. How do you do that? Like, how would you encourage somebody or how does that process work you to take a thought? Regardless, I, I'm not even talking about sexual thoughts at this point. Any thought that you know is ungodly, the, 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 the temptation to lie or the temptation to do whatever. Yeah. And I think it's like we don't meditate on all the things we're not supposed to do, but we meditate on him. And I want to read this verse out of uh, Colossians 3, because mm. I think it's so powerful. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And so we're to th- seek those things above. We're to meditate on Christ and on the throne room of God and to fill our minds with godly things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. We're not like just, oh, I'm going to try to not think about stealing. I'm going to try to not think, you know? Yeah. It's like when I'm on a diet, I think about food all the time. So it's it's asking God to say, hey, <laughs> help me, help me. You know, and it's that whole Paul saying, you know, let this mind be in you. That's mm-hmm. also in Christ Jesus. And to realize that's a process. Right, it, it may is. not happen overnight. It may. It took you, it, 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 from the time we met, two years to process through to come to that. Now you were already on a spiritual journey based on right. what you shared here, anyway. Right. But it took it took that time, and and this is one of the things I really want to tell everybody: when somebody is in that process, be patient with them, but don't give up by not interceding or by being that in under the umbrella of inclusivity. Mm-hmm be condoning of something right. that, would, that will hurt them or that will ultimately, because right. later they'll turn around going, hey, you deceived me, Yeah, you know? And so it's a, how do we, so a, a, a dear friend of mine, a close friend for many, many decades, actually, you know, was just sharing with me, hey, you know, my daughter, you know, she's being inundated in school by all this, um, you know, if you've had any questions. So just if anybody's depressed, well, you may be, you actually may be attracted to the op- the same sex. And you maybe have been, so you're just depressed. Well, it's probably because like they're, they're taking any and everything to promote this agenda yeah, you're of, right. of moving people towards same-sex attraction. And so she, all of a sudden, she takes the bait. She's a, she's a great athlete and is a great, and, and I, I, I've, I've known her since she's a little girl, you know? And, and all of a sudden, my friend is like, man, you know, and these are, this guy is a church elder. He's a he's a leader. He's a, I, when I met him, he was pastoring, you know. Um, and and so like somebody who is in his situation, where they're going, you know, and and the the daughter's like, hey, I want to bring I want to bring my girlfriend for Christmas and Thanksgiving, and I want you guys to treat her like we're a couple. I want you to what. How do you advise? Like, what what's your advice to respond to somebody in that? Because we want to please God, and yeah. we don't want to be we don't want to take on this inclusivity to the point of condoning sin, but we want to be loving. Like, what? Right. Just from in your spirit, what you're feeling? How would you counsel somebody like that? Yeah, because you're I a think- Christian leader. You're a leader in the body of Christ now as a missionary. How would you speak to that? How would you speak to them? Yeah, uh, it's de- that's definitely tricky, right? Yeah, it is. I, I do think, because even throughout all that, like God never cut, like he was there through every step, right? So I'm a big advocate of meeting people where there are and not like, oh, I'm going to cut off relationship right. from you. Now, it's different if someone is like a mature Christian and they decide, hey, you know what? I'm just going to rebel against God and get into sexual immorality. That's a different situation. And this person then, grew up in church their whole life. So there's a bit of that. There's there. a bit of that. Yeah. But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I don't know. I think because I have relationship with people that are in all kinds of ungodly situations. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to cut some, say someone has like um, uh, someone that has a porn addiction 
or something like that? Like, am I going to say, well, I'm not going to have a relationship with you or, um, yeah. Now if she's like, what is she, does she claiming to be a Christian? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That does get a little bit more dicey when you have someone who's, who's, uh, say that you're a Christian and you start teaching here heresy. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more, okay. I might need to break fellowship. Right. With you. But if you're, you know, if it's a family relationship and someone is going through something that's ungodly, I wouldn't cut off relationship. That is just me. Yeah. Is it, is it, because you said this several times in this uh, podcast, you need to really pray and ask the Holy Spirit. And it seems like that's where, you, that seems to be what you keep falling back to. And, and, and I, I agree with that mm -hmm. because I what I've learned is that there's no cookie cutter answer. No, there's not. And that it really is because my relating with you and with Mary at that time was different. Some of the people at my church, they heard my stance. Right. They knew where I was at. Now, what I would do before, and I shared this with you last night when we were having dinner, I would go in and I would tell, I would go to the different people in the church. If I knew people were in sexual sin, because I would do a two-part series on sex every year in my church. Mm -hmm. And I would talk about, we talked about everything. We talked about porn. We talked about masturbation. We talked about uh, same-sex relationships, uh, heterosexual relationship, fornication, adultery. We try to cover all the basis to, to get people to understand and to be for people to, and people that I knew. So, I mean, I would approach, you know, people that were in same sex relationships and I would mm -hmm. say what I would say the same thing. If I knew somebody was in adultery or fornication, or if I knew somebody, I would stop and I would say, and this is, this was our stance. We want all of them coming to church. Right. We don't want them not coming to church. Right. Now what we did have to, we did have to say to several of our same sex couples in the church is we would have to tell them guys you can't do pdas here mm -hmm. you can't do public dis displays of affection mm -hmm. some people like i never really saw that with you and mary but mm -hmm. i but many people in my church would would start getting really cuddly on a in a service yeah. <laughs> and, things like, and i'd be like, like guys look and i'd always start you know how much i love you you know, I and, and you and I'm yeah. usually the ones who invited them to church because I was ministering in that community so much. Right. I'd be like, you know, I love you, but you know our stance on this, mm -hmm. and I can't have you doing that here. I want you here, but I can't have that here. Right. And so it was always hard because I never wanted them to hear the, you know, it is true God hates the sin, but He loves the sinner. But I I wanted to be careful with communicating anything and that was, you know, any of that type of thing that would make them feel shamed or isolated, sure. you know, but yet I wanted to encourage and bless their conviction side of things. And so I would have to say things like that periodically. But what I found was that they were super responsive to my love, mm -hmm. to my, and I remember some guys who had, and and there were there were two guys in particular in our church. When I say guys, I mean literal guys that were uh, not like a gender <laughs> sort of guys, meaning guys and gals, you know, type of thing. But I would I would be very loving, expressive. To, I'd always give them a hug every time I saw them, and I would always I'd, I'd always just you know be very let them know. Look, I'm not afraid of you. And I'm not afraid of you misinterpreting my love for you. Right. Because I know where it's coming from. Right. And I know where it's at. You know, for me, it was very, I had very paternal feelings for it. Even, even, even some of the men that were older than me. Mm -hmm. But I had paternal feelings as a, as a spiritual leader in the church for them. But I would, I would have to clearly draw lines and say, look, you know, can't, you know, can't have any PDAs, can't have any. And I would say to him, I'd say, but. But I'm about to preach on something. It's going to make you probably feel really uncomfortable. You're probably even going to get mad at me. <laughs> but just so you know, it's not personal. Right. I'm not speaking against you. I love you. I care about you. But I must address the biblical perspective of this because we want mm -hmm. to honor God. This is the house of God. And this is where the truth must be spoken. That's must, right. But just so you know, this is not isolating you, not abandoning you, not throwing you under the bus or kicking you to the curb. 
I love you. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, I'd say, and and just so you know, it's going to make you feel singled out. Mm -hmm. Because when I talk about that particular area of sin, you're going to think I'm trying to, because I know what Satan does with it, Nadia. Right. He tries to make them feel like that guy actually hates you. That guy actually has something against you. They're actually trying to shame you. They're actually, and so I would try to preemptively go have that conversation and speak to that so that they would feel that love and they would hear. Yeah. And then I'd say, I'd say, now there was one couple, they got mad at me every year. <laughs> <laughs> they would leave for a month, three years in a row, they would leave for a month every time after I'd preach on it. <gasps> That's hilarious. But then they would come back. And they would say, well, we know you love us. Mm. And we know you love, we, we don't agree with what you're teaching. I'm like, you're free to disagree, but I'm going to preach the truth. Yeah. And I'm going to tell the truth and because I have to. And because, listen, I don't want God mad at me. I can handle you being mad at me. That's but I right. I can't handle God being upset That's and right. going, you lied to my kids. You yeah. know, because to condone sin is to intentionally whether you don't think it is, it's to perpetuate that wedge separating them from God. That's right. And I don't want to do that because I love them. That's right. And sin hinders us from fulfilling our calling as well. So true. So you're messing with people's destinies when we do that. That's so good. Man, that'll preach right there. Yeah. (laughs) But you're a preacher, so I'm not surprised. (laughs) Anything else from the word that the Lord's spoken to you in any of this or anything that you Let's sense? just read um, this verse from, from Hebrews 12 because I just think it's so powerful. And that's the thing, sin, it hinders us and it weighs us down. Mm-hmm. Okay, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, mm. let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set for, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so I just want to encourage everyone listening right now if there's anything that you're struggling with if you're i see somebody that you're struggling with anger i just see you in the kitchen i see you smashing plates mm-hmm. and you literally you took a plate and you threw it against the wall and i i want to tell you right now the lord wants to deliver you of that anger right now and so i just speak to that any spirit of anger i command to leave in jesus name if there's anybody, there's somebody that's they're struggling with just like that repetitive, like the worry and the anxious thoughts. And I just see the Lord just bringing peace to your mind right now. And I just pray that there would be, that your mind would just be washed in the blood of Jesus and where there are like unhealthy pathways, these kind of cycles that you get caught in, that God would just break that in Jesus' name and that God would just bring a freedom to you. And I just pray that verse from Colossians 3, that you'd be able to set your mind on the things that are above and that he would just give you peace that would surpass all understanding. And um, even just, I, I feel like there's somebody with the body dysmorphia that God wants to, you know, you hate your body. I feel like God wants to just reveal the truth of your beauty in him and to even break, there's like food addiction, just to break that food addiction. Um, In Jesus' name. Yeah, I thank you, Father. I thank you for everyone that's listened today, Lord, and anyone that's struggling with the gender identity, with sexual identity. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would just speak truth to them. God, that you would reveal your love and that you would reveal truth in that, Lord, that you would just set them free, Lord Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you would release wisdom to the body of Christ, that to the pastors, to the leaders, that are listening right now, that you would give them divine wisdom, yes, Lord, Jesus. for the situations that they're dealing with, Lord Jesus. And even even for people that, that you've got a family member, you've got friends that are going through this, God, we need wisdom from heaven, Lord. And so I pray for that, God. And I pray, um, yeah, I cancel every assignment of the enemy against this call, God. I thank you that your word doesn't return void, but it will accomplish the purpose for which you set out to accomplish, God. We're praying for fruit that would remain from this podcast. I bless everyone listening in Jesus' name. Man, that's good. That's good. 
I love that. See, you're getting to see the the prophet, the the preacher that Nadia really is, and I absolutely <laughs> love that. Well, let me tell you. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you for being willing to speak to this. Of course. Thank you for being willing to address this. And and you have friends that are still in this community. Mm-hmm. You have friends and people that you love and that you care about. And and I love it because you're 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 not you're not willing to not be truthful, you know, in order to make them feel like, you know, they're okay, but to actually speak that truth and to be able to reveal that any, any, uh, you know, to any, any family members, maybe just pray for anybody who's really going, Lord, I don't know what to do about a family member. I'm not sure what's the right thing in this. Mm. Would you just speak to that or even just pray for them too? Because I feel like I just sense there's a lot of people watching that are having family that and they're struggling with this area because they love them and you should love them. Yeah. But it's almost, it's like, I just see them like in pain and agony over that family member. And I, I heard the Lord just say that the burden belongs to the Lord. And I just feel that invitation just to hand it over to him and just just to release that burden, just to pray, just to love them, but that it's not your responsibility to bring about a change, that it's really only the Lord who can do that. And I think especially with our families, and I've experienced this with unsaved family members, you know, there's been points in my walk where I felt like, oh, I need to make something happen, you know, but it has to be the timing of the Lord. And we have to be sensitive, like when you're supposed to speak into their life, you know, when we're supposed to hold our tongue. And that's something that I had to learn. Um, but I've, I've gone through periods of where you're agonizing, yeah. you know, over, over family members as opposed to, to resting, in, you know, in God's goodness. You know, I have a cousin who I love dearly. She's a dear, she's, she's wonderful. She's, she's, she's just very motherly, just, just, She's, she's incredible. And she was a strong believer for so long. And then her husband passed away and, and she ended up going in, living with a woman, was with a woman for many years in a, in a sexual, same sex relationship. And, and man, I, I actually contacted her and I apologized to her because I didn't reach out sooner. And by the time that we actually connected, she had repented and gotten out of it and wow. been freed from it. Come on. And so, yeah, which That's I was so celebrating, good. but I also felt bad because as walking with you and Mary, I wanted to walk with my own cousin. And, and, and so, and, and, but it was one of those things. I mean, it was, I was in a terribly busy time in my life and I was doing lots of ministry stuff. This was just a few years ago, by the way. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she's like, oh, don't feel any, you know, I knew the truth. I knew, I said, yeah, but I wanted to be there loving you. I wanted to be <laughs> there as that person who, you know, and so, and I, I, I say a lot of things that are very provocative and a lot of people see that a lot of it is me provoking the people that are enabling this type of sin. That, that's the ones that make me the angriest. Right, right. That's what makes me mad. And it's not so much of of the people that are in the confusion or in the deception yeah, themselves, totally. but those who are enabling that. And by the grace of God, you know, so reach out to those people, love them, tell them how much you love them, how that you're praying for them, how that you you want to be a, an encourager to them and 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 be that, that, that love of Christ. I really want to mm-hmm. encourage that because thank God you felt that in our relationship, yeah. because that's how I felt about you guys, and Aww. really did love you, and 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 then and then see the fruit of that, and wow. that intercession, and that you know, um, and this was somebody that was in a place of rebellion. Mm-hmm. They were in that place. They were in a place of pain too. They were in a hardship, you know. Uh, but by the grace of God, you know, they're back into the place of freedom, and I just thank God for that. Wow. So so stay in that. Uh, Again, Nadia, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're you're a special, special dear friend, and always. I like I said, I see you as family, so Aww. that's how I, that's where I'm at. But um, for all those watching, listen, thank you for tuning in. Share this program. 
get this out. We want people to come into the freedom that Christ has and operating in the true identity that he always intended them to be in and to be free from the deception of what people are are turning around right now. People are, are talking about when we say things like that, they're going, oh, you're being political. No, the enemy is using a political system to perpetuate his message of deception and lies. That's and we right. want to expose the lie of the enemy because that's where people are getting caught and trapped and they are purely, truly the innocent bystanders that are being wrapped up in this deception. And so speak the truth in love, be loving, but don't leave the truth out. And as always, get more radical. <laughs> we need more radical believers That's out right. there, right, Nadia? That's totally right. We need right. those bold, radical believers. So we want to thank you for participating, watching. Please share this, get the word out, and stay radical. This week's podcast is brought to you by Robbie Dawkins Ministries. Do you know someone who would be impacted by today's episode? Share it with them and let us know what they think. Subscribe or follow this podcast so you don't miss our next episode. You can also leave us a review, like, comment, and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Until next time, stay radical.